It's just someone's car. So what if you hotwired it and wrecked it chasing down some anarch scumbags for the slim chance of getting a favor out of the prince? Whoever owned it probably had it insured anyway, and it's not like material goods matter much when you're undead. At least you didn't hurt anyone. So you drained him dry. Big deal. I mean, fair, he was a living person. He had dreams, ambitions, friends and family. Probably. It's not like you knew him. And besides, maybe he had some kind of terminal sickness anyway. Maybe he was gonna get hit by a car tomorrow. Either way, he'd be dead sooner or later. At least he went out with the pleasure of the kiss, you know. There are worse ways to go. The bastard was hiding with a human family, as if that would protect him or earn your sympathy. He kept jabbering on about how he hadn't told them anything as you drained the daughter dry, tossing her body to the side like a broken rag doll. You would work your way through the family one by one. You didn't really care if he agreed to come with you or not. It was a matter of principle. They would always be more kind. They bred like rats, after all. Bright lights of the city. They make you nervous. Too easy to be spotted. Hide in the outskirts. Under bridge. Food comes here. You don't know why. You don't care. Empty them. Drink them dry. Piles of bones in your hole. Need to leave soon. Might get found. Hungry. So hungry. For an immortal being like a kindred, it would seem that very little pose an actual threat if one is careful enough. Food is in abundance, as long as the kindred doesn't get greedy or careless, and few human needs are theirs anymore. Warmth and shelter is needed only to provide a good cover and avoid suspicion. And to some, not even that is a necessity. Vampire hunters and other creatures of the night may pose a threat, other vampires too of course, but even that is easy enough to dodge if one is conscious enough of their actions, and lack the ambitions to be a threat to the other kindred. Indeed, after the first few years of fumbling through the dark, most kindreds will become quite accustomed to their new nature, and may consider themselves above humanity in the food chain. Yet they all have something humanity lacks, and that is the beast. It lies within the heart of each kindred, waiting for the right moment to strike. It tempts each vampire with the easy broad path to damnation, and it is the most base and monstrous part of their nature. It is the predator's instinct, disguised as a voice of reason, and its siren call is always the most tempting whenever the vampire has the most to lose. Eventually, as a vampire commits worse and worse atrocities, they will start to rationalize these dark deeds to themselves. Material property is irrelevant. A few broken bones is better than dead. Dead is at least not damned. This slip of morality is the first sign that a vampire risks losing themselves to the beast, but unless others nearby are able to spot the signs, or the vampire is the owner of an impressive understanding of themselves, the kindred's descent will rapidly snowball into an inevitable tumble towards the vassile, the final frenzy. Of course the vampire's appearance is affected by this as well. The weaker that flicker of humanity is within them, the less human they appear. Pale, threatening, wild-eyed and emanating almost an aura of danger, most mortals will subconsciously avoid them, their instincts warning them of the danger the kindred poses. And for a good reason. Once sufficiently jaded to human suffering, some kindred find perverse pleasure in causing wanton pain and slaughter in mortals merely to feel something. Eventually, of course, a kindred walking this path will lose that last flicker of humanity that keeps them tethered to where they are. All it takes is that one final frenzy, the vassile, and the beast assumes control over the vampire who becomes a white. And once they do, they are beyond saving. There are certainly stories of ancient vampires who have overcome this curse and have regained their senses, but those stories are considered nothing but legends by kindreds wise enough to know better. A white is not mindless, of course. Such a creature would quite quickly face their final death by sunlight, lacking any sense of preservation. No, rather they are merely stripped of what made them human. Just like an animal would shun fire and deep waters, so too does a white avoid threats to its cursed existence. It will hunt, sometimes even carefully, and might even develop rudimentary hunting tactics. It is, however, by its very nature incapable of learning. All but the most intuitive of knowledges is lost to it, although particularly strong-minded kindred may retain some shadow of what they once knew, 
barring anything too academical or intellectual. They may latch onto a basic understanding of driving, but they would not be able to use a computer or argue law in court. Firing a gun may be familiar to them, but they would never again play the violin. Most whites are influenced by who they were before their degeneration. A lone wolf gangrel will still remain distant and reluctant to encounter others, while a Nosferatu who was lashing out against a society that had abandoned them would become even more violent and unpredictable at this stage. Those whites rarely live for more than a few nights, however, as few vampires, be they Camarilla, Sabat, or Anarchs, would want these vile creatures risking a breach of the masquerade with their wanton slaughter. In fact, these sects tend to have specialized hunters whose job it is to track down and slay whites, often for some reimbursement in the shape of boons or money from the local leaders. A white found by the police, for example, could still be identified, and lacking the intellect to manipulate their way out of that situation, such a discovery could quickly spiral far out of the control of any local vampire authorities. And on the topic of manipulation, few vampiric disciplines are still available to them. It would seem that blood magic and such arts are often far too complex and intellectual for any white to recall, but the more simple, physical disciplines, such as protean, fortitude, potence, and celerity, are not. Some powers of auspex, especially heightened senses, would still be possible, and rudimentary use of obfuscate as well, at least those powers relying on hiding oneself in shadows. Anything requiring more complex thought, such as the Mask of a Thousand Faces, would be impossible for a creature that can barely even recognize facial traits anymore. Simply put, whites retain whatever disciplines are crucial for their survival, and which require little conscious thought aside from the will to exert their force upon themselves or others. Rituals, of course, are always forgotten. Whites tend to care very little for their appearance, and are often in a poor state. While their immortal bodies do not age or starve, there is still an unkempt and disturbing look to them, and whatever clothes they may wear are seldom for modesty, but simply what they wore when they suffered their final frenzy. Perhaps some of the urban legends about wild, feral humans living in the outskirts of civilization and preying on hikers have some truth to them. A white is also often far more susceptible to human folklore than a vampire would be. Local superstition, should the white have been aware of it when they still had their senses, may in fact have debilitating, if not lethal, effects on them. Everything from spilling beans on the ground for the white to count, to leaving a mountain rose on the chest of it, a bit of a Swiss vampire superstition, seem to be effective. It is not known why this is, but some philosophically inclined kindred believe that it is because a white is no longer a thinking being, thus they are unable to understand that they are cursed. Lacking this insight, they are instead made susceptible to human folklore, so that they may suffer regardless of the state they are in. Whether this is some manner of divine compensation is unknown, and not anything I would wish to make a definitive statement on in this text. Whites are generally considered to be in a permanent state of frenzy, although of course they are not quite as violent or unpredictable as a kindred suffering under it. They do not feel pain or are debilitated by it. A white who has lost a leg will keep on fighting even while missing it, and they rarely, if ever, hold back. They do not temper themselves, and can therefore be quite deadly foes if one does not know what to expect. That being said, they are also cowardly. Fire and sunlight frighten them even more than a common vampire, and thus they will often quickly depart if threatened by either. Of course, if they are cornered, they will fight like, well, a cornered beast to escape their doom. Likewise, they also seem to avoid open water, presumably not realizing that they are able to traverse it either above or beneath the surface. Or perhaps they merely believe in the old wife's tale about running waters and vampires. Whites are loners, but they are known to form packs as well. Indeed, this is perhaps the most dangerous aspect of them, at least in theory. In practice, the most dangerous thing about a white is probably that they can be as young or old as you can imagine with literally no way of gauging. Whites are surprisingly hierarchical, and when they come together they tend to gauge each other's strengths and then form a pecking order out of that. It is not always that whites do this. Sometimes they will fight each other to the death, or even just leave each other alone. But when they do form packs, they will behave almost like wolves. The leader will feed first, they will hunt through attrition, and the weaker ones will even willingly sacrifice themselves for the leader should it come to that. This is of course quite rare. 
but one should always be careful when hunting whites, as this is yet another aspect that is difficult to predict. It would be quite an unfortunate situation if a hunter were to approach the hiding place of a cannibal murderer, only to be assaulted from three directions at once by lesser, yet still deadly whites who are protecting their leader. Diablerizing whites is also a risky business. Their blood is undeniably tainted by the beast, and should their soul be consumed, nightmares are sure to haunt their killers. If the blood of the white is sufficiently potent, it may even cause permanent harm to the Diablerist's psyche as these dark impulses fester in the soul of them. So is it any surprise then that whites are hunted with such determination? They are not only a constant reminder of the fate which any kindred, old or young, may succumb to, but they are also liabilities to the precious masquerade protecting kindred from humanity. Not to mention highly dangerous killers who have no remorse or care about who or what they hunt. Any kindred or canine at risk of succumbing to the allure of the wasile would do best to focus their will on trying to journey one of the paths of enlightenment of vampire society, for while inhuman by their nature, they help serve as a bulwark against the hopeless and nihilistic fate that becoming a white offers. This video was brought to you by the antediluvian Dugal, who sought more wisdom on the matters of whites and their nature. I hope you have found this to your liking, and I thank you once again for your patronage.